Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Choice. I'm here with Chris and he's going to talk with you about his real estate journey. It's an interesting one. So let's get straight into it. Chris, I have a really, really difficult question for you to start. When did you become an agent? <laughs> well, I actually, that's a kind of a loaded question. I actually became an agent a year and a half ago. But I've been an investor for okay. about almost 20 years. 20 years as an investor. What kind of investments were you doing? I mainly just do uh, residential uh, real estate. I like single family homes. Um, they're easier for me. Um, I can put a qualified tenant in them. And as long as they take care of the house, they're almost maintenance free. So those have always been my favorites. So you you bought up a lot of rentals. You have a pretty large rental portfolio then, or what? Or did you manage the portfolio? What were you doing? Well, we started out with two properties, and I tried to do everything myself. And once I realized that I am not, um, I am not Superman, I got my butt handed to me. I lost them, and I went back and got an education, and came back in, uh, bought more properties. Uh, started figuring out creative financing, creative uh, financial solutions, and dealing directly with homeowners and uh, private lenders. That was my big thing. And over the time, we've gotten up to almost 20 doors um, at one point. And then, of course, when uh, COVID came in and the market went crazy high, we had to thin out the uh, the lesser attractive ones. But we've had, um, but yeah, we've had, uh, we're, we're so well, that around makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and we're hoping to get up to about thirty or forty before the portfolio is done. Wow. Well, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty healthy sized portfolio. Um, throughout not just your agent career but your investing career, what would you say is the most wild event or story that you had happen across your time in, in the industry? <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, probably the wildest <laughs> story that I had in my career was, well, one, we inherited a property that already had a tenant. And in Georgia, it's not difficult to get a tenant out. But this one ran through a lot of hurdles and went, extremely out of her way to um drag it through the court system ultimately we got her out but uh, she came up with some creative um ideas on how to come up with excuses or how to uh circumvent the system to make sure that she held on just a little bit longer um that was probably our most eventful one but other than that the uh the biggest um the biggest shortcoming that we've ran into actually was dealing with um other investors that we uh partnered up with that um we didn't vet nearly as well as we should have i actually uh we did a lending job on uh, a portfolio of about a dozen houses and i was naive back then i trusted them to take care of the properties that they were buying i was being the lender and i learned real quick um they didn't take care of the properties. They didn't pay the taxes. And I ended up having to foreclose on them and try to fix those houses up, pay all the back taxes, and ultimately get all my money back out, which took us about seven years, but we eventually broke even. Gosh. Yeah, no, that's... uh. Whew. That's uh, it's just how it goes. That's the business for you. So. Next question. When did you make the choice to become an agent? You were already doing investments. You already had a pretty strong portfolio, right? You said you already had 20 houses or so before you even became an agent. Um, what made you make the leap into doing that um, and why? Well, if you talk to any investor or anybody in business that is savvy enough, they're going to tell you, you've got to change with the times. You've got to uh, follow the cheese. And 
In 2020, when COVID came in, the market just went completely opposite of really what it should have. And as they say, the cheese moved. And during COVID, after COVID, in our area, of course, the market went high because of lack of inventory. Then it also went high because of artificial inflation with uh, government fundings getting dumped into the system and all that. So it was almost impossible to find any kind of a deal or anything that an investor would be interested in buying. Right now, um, around here, if we can't get um, 10% rent on the purchase price of the house, then it's not worth it to us. Now, our numbers are worse than Florida's. You know, if we can get 3 or 4% on a return, it's considered decent. So since it was so difficult to find investor deals, everybody was selling retail. So I had no choice. I went to uh, a uh, brokerage that was offering to pay for my, um, to get my, take my course, do the post test and all that. All I had to do was just show up and pay my uh, post test fee and they pay for the course. So I figured free education, why not? That's where the uh, money's going is the retail. Um, sector. So I chased it into the retail section and became an agent. Wow. So did, when you started, did you start uh, full time straight away or did you kind of uh, take your time to edge your way into the business fully? No, as a matter of fact, I've still got a W-2 job now. So I'm bouncing between an eight hour a day job and uh, doing my investor slash real estate agent uh, work. So I work on, um, I've got a pretty easy W-2 job, so I can kind of interweave the two together a little bit uh, when time allows. And then once I get off my regular job, then I can do my real estate uh, in the afternoons and on the weekends. Luckily, I've been doing it long enough. I've kind of learned how to, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, what what kind of work do, do you do? I'm a uh, I'm a civil service. Okay, cool. Well, um, if you had to look at your business right now, and I know you haven't been an agent for very long, but you've been an investor for a long time. In either version, uh, where would you say you get the best sources of your leads today? I've done a little bit of everything, um, postcards, mailings. Um, I spent a lot of money on Google AdWords, a um, little bit of Facebook ads. And even today, the two sources of leads that, and granted, I'm not getting a whole lot of leads because I'm dividing a lot of my time. But the two best sources that I'm getting that seem to produce the best for me is my either my uh, SEO for my online website or uh, kicking doors and um, pounding pavement, getting out in the network, getting out, shaking hands, kissing babies, um, talking to people at the kids sporting events. Um, going to the Chamber of Commerce events and um, networking with the local business owners. Those have probably been uh, some of my best lead or best uh, sources of leads other than just um, actual door knocking. I don't mind door knocking. Some people have a uh, phobia of it, but uh, honestly, in seven, eight years of door knocking um, once or twice a month, I think I've had two doors actually slammed in my face, so I'm not afraid of it. And it seems to, as long as you've got the proper approach, it seems to be one of my best lead sources. Yeah, you know, I, I did some door knocking a, a lot throughout my career, actually. And my worst case scenario is I was met with a shotgun because I had accidentally woken up their baby in the middle of the day. And so, <laughs> but, you know, that's not normal. That's not a typical thing that happens. So, guys, if you're listening to this, do not think that you're going to have a shotgun pointed at you. It's very unlikely. If you do it you for 11 years, years like me, states. it's possible. Now, if you were talking to, yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, Chris, if you were talking to a new agent, or maybe they're an agent that's just struggling and they're having trouble getting traction in their business, what would you tell them to kind of move the needle in the right direction? Well, first I tell them if they ever figure it out, let me know. But <laughs> but um, if they were struggling and trying to get in the right direction, I cut my teeth as an investor first and then as a real estate agent second. And I guess there's kind of a prelude to that. Investors think way different than agents do. Agents are taught a set of rules, and those are the rules that you follow, no questions asked. Investors are taught, read the rules, study the rules, and get as close to the edge as you can without breaking the rules. And if it doesn't say you can't do it, do it. So when I cut my teeth on that side, my first question is, why not? And that mentality, going to the investor side first and then going to the agent side second, probably did me more good than anything. So a new agent uh, coming up, I would say, um, and it's very easy to find them, um, Atlanta, Savannah, uh, Cleveland is a big one. Go online, find real estate investor groups. Um, you can look up reiclub.org, I believe it's called, but find local investor groups in your area, walk in, sit down, shut up, and listen to the investors talk, listen to what they're doing and how they're doing it, and be their gopher. And they will t show you so much about the real estate world that the agent side won't. And if you get in good with the uh, investors, you're going to have so many repeat clients. A retail um, client is going to come back maybe once, maybe twice, but an investor is going to make you know maybe ten or twelve deals a year. So you can make a lot more money with investors in your uh, network than just doing retail buyers alone. And like I said. They've got a whole different mentality, so they're going to show you the little gray areas where the rules say you can't do this, but it doesn't say you can't do that. And they'll teach you a lot of creative things that will make you more valuable to all your clients. As an example, um, one of my biggest mentors is Pete Fortunato down in Tampa, Florida. I love that man to death, and he will teach you anything you want to know. Okay. And he never, ever thinks inside the box he has got stories about um situations where he came off out of left field and came up with a solution that nobody would have thought of and that's because of you know a lot of practice and being in the investors world but um i lost my train of thought <laughs> But that was um that was one of the things that helped no, me No that's learn. okay you know it's absolutely true you know, yeah, it's it's absolutely true because, you know, when you look at investors, I look at even just my own business when I was peaking in my production days, um, a lot of our business came from new developers that are building houses, buying lots of lots all at once. I, I, I was, you know, doing a lot of business with fixing flip guys, wholesale guys, all that stuff. And when you get working with that, you know, you get one or two or three or five or 10 great relationships with people that are doing and they don't even have to be doing a lot. Maybe they're only doing one deal every two or three months. That's fine. Get 10 of those. And you now have a more productive business than 99% of real estate agents. And I think you're absolutely right. When you look at the average agent, and this is a little bit of a sad statistic, there's a 47% or something like that agents do not own interest in any real estate themselves. And so that alone kind of makes it difficult for them to even fully comprehend the business, I think, sometimes. And when you come at it from an investor perspective, you now kind of have a right to help uh, ferry other investors through that process because you've done it yourself. I'm a big believer that if you've done something, you are now more qualified 
to explain it, train it, and help people through that kind of a process. And if you've never done it, how in the world are people supposed to trust that you're the person that they should go to for advice? Yeah, and there's a lot of them. If you don't know, if you've never bled yourself, then how do you know how to put on a Band-Aid? Exactly. You can't. You just can't. So when you look at the your your average day right now, what would you say is the most productive part of your day? Hmm. That's kind of difficult because I wear so many hats. Um over half of my day consists mm-hmm. of marketing um working my website working um uh social media leads uh making cold calls uh whenever <laughs> time allows and i've got my listings that i have right now that are bringing in buyers and of course i've got a couple that are under contract so there's no more um i can't offer them that one but that gives me a perfect opportunity to take their information find out what their criteria is and go find something for them as well. So just being on the phone, even if it's not real estate related, um, is my probably my top priority is just being on the phone, talking to people, reminding them that I'm still out here. And not even if not even talking about real estate, just just talking to them about anything that will keep me in the front of their mind. Perfect, perfect. Well, if um if you could look at all of the the clients that you're now working with what would you say is something that is consistent between them is there a specific type of client or avatar of a client that is more normal for you at this point or is it kind of just people that are all different and there's no kind of um, avatar at this point. Hmm. Probably go off on a tangent with that one. And, uh, let me start back with what I was talking about with Pete Fortunato. One of the biggest things that I learned as when I started out as an investor was they didn't care what the situation was. They got good at one thing. And once they got good at it, they switched to something else, switched to something else. They made their toolbox as big as possible. So over the years, I've managed to add foreclosures, probates, 1031 exchange, um, tax laws, and I've studied all that. So now it pretty much doesn't matter what kind of client stands in front of me. I can usually figure out some way or I've got a resource to direct them to. In the last six months, most of my clients are dealing with... um, large tracts of land on a house with a house and they want to get out of town they want to be in the rural areas and those are the people that a couple of the listings that i got just kind of dropped in my lap and they needed help so i've got their house listed they're out in the country they're bringing in more people that are coming in from out of state that are looking to be outside of the city limits on land in a nice house where it's quiet And that's just the clientele that just happens to be crossing my path right now. In three months, I could be dead in the middle of downtown Atlanta with, you know, townhouses. It just kind of depends on what client crosses my path and just being able to handle that client right off the bat. Yeah, no, that's that's really fair. You got to send me those uh, those listings with land. My wife keeps telling me she wants dairy cows, and I'm like, our yard's <laughs> not big enough. So uh, you got to send me those listings. I'll check it out. Um, and she also wants horses. So you know, I don't know if you knew this, but my name's Garth. My first uh, my first job was actually with horses. I was a stable boy um, when I was really young, and oh, so wow. we have a. Okay. We have a bit of a history in that life, but we've never had the land to support it in, you know, our personal lives. Um, I digress. Uh, so what would you say at this point? I know you're doing really well in the growth of your business, especially for how short of a time you've been an agent. Um, 
what would you say today, at least, and this will always change, but what would you say today is your biggest struggle? Time management, um, prioritizing my day, um, mm-hmm. just operating the business in general is probably my biggest because, you know, I haven't been with you guys long and y'all have got so much information between the main brokerage and us as a uh, as an individual group. So it's like, again, you know, drinking water through a fire hose and I'm trying to take it all in and hope I can retain it all. So my biggest challenge right now is being able to organize everything that's coming in, processing it and prioritizing what do I need to learn first? What do I need to do first? And, you know, taking, figuring out what the top three things that will make my business grow today and then do it again tomorrow. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I think one of the, a lot of people's struggle is just trying to figure out what to do on a day-to-day basis. And, uh, that's also partly why we made one place because it, it with all the task management and the calendar integrations and the different things that can kind of keep you on track. Um, but when, when you say that you're, 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 you're right now, you're still, uh, right now you're still part-time cause you have your other job, right? So do mm-hmm. you have a, is it like a plan to eventually go full time? And like, is that a monetary goal, a transaction number? What's what's the plan around that? Because uh, people are always fascinated with what it takes to actually make a full time pivot. <laughs> well, I actually planned on going full time like a year or two ago, but that didn't happen. But right now, my um, my milestone would be once I originally planned on having twice my income coming in as investments in rental property. But now that the market's changed, my new goal has kind of switched over to the agent side. Now, if I can steadily maintain three new listings per month, that would get me where I need to be to go full time. That, that'd that be a great goal. I think everybody would love to be in a situation where they had three new listings a, a, a month too. Um, now, this is uh, more of a, maybe of a, a, a difficult question. If you were to have uh, changed something in your business, if you could go back and change something about it, maybe, because I know you didn't start that long ago, but when you were first starting, because a lot of the people that are going to watch this are maybe new agents or just about to get licensed. When you were just starting, what was something that you would have changed in your business um, to maybe have helped you grow faster or more efficiently? Hmm. That's actually an easy one. The one thing that I did not do that I've learned since I need to is when the revenue comes in, I know grandma and grandpa used to put their money in different envelopes for different bills and different expenses. And I've since learned that I really need to be doing that too. Mm -hmm. One, of course, for taxes. One for me. One for an assistant. Because again, I'm old school. I'm trying to do everything myself. And this is not a, this is a team effort. This is a team sport. And that was the biggest, that's still the biggest thing that my hard head is, is fighting is trying to step away from the chores that are not making me money directly and passing those off to somebody that A, can do it better, B, do it more efficiently, and C, do it cheaper per hour than what it's costing me to do it myself. So that would be my top priority would be if I had to go back, allocate the funds that I need to put the lesser chores on somebody else. That makes sense. You know, I, uh, I do the same thing. So actually when, when money comes in and depending on the business, cause we've got multiple, right. We've got the park place brand. We've got the one place brand we've got, and they're different businesses. And Austin and I work together and I have sales and I, we got lots of stuff going on. Um, 
And, but, but when all that happens, they come into separate accounts and stuff like that, those consolidate and there's holding companies and everything else. But when it trickles to me, right, I still have multiple different bank accounts that some of them I never see, right? So money comes in, 30% gets allocated here. Money comes in, Mm -hmm. 20% gets allocated here. Money comes in, 50% allocated here. And I don't even see the money allocated in two of the different uh, places. And it's probably it's not relevant that, like... for me to see it, right? So like taxes, savings, and or or bond markets, or offs, whatever the, the, the case is with what that what's happening in those, um, or even in, uh, future investments or development deals or whatever. But like it's all separated out before I even do anything. So and and and, and anybody watching this, you can create rules in your bank for when uh, money comes in, that it automatically distributes or it moves to separate accounts or something like that. So you can make your life easier. One of the biggest struggles I've seen a lot of agents deal with is tax season rolls around and they've saved nothing because they lived on the actual money that they made and they did not save enough on the side. And I'll say this, I understand a lot of you are not in the tax bracket that requires you to save 30, 40%. That's not relevant. Save that 30% anyways until you get to probably over five, six hundred thousand dollars Your effective rate isn't going to be above that. And so if you, if you save at 30%, it's going to be okay for now. And at the end of the year, when you pay out from that account, if there's extra, that just starts next year's faster. Do not start giving yourself bonuses from it. Let that grow without you even realizing it. Eventually, when it's a large enough number that it starts to make sense, port that over to your investments accounts. And Mm -hmm. that way you're never in tax trouble. And also you consistently grow money that you forget is there, which is great when you, that's, that's what I call realtor math. You know, (laughs) Um, but anyways, um, so last question, this one's just something that, what what would you want to leave to somebody, whoever's listening to this, whether a hyper productive agent or a new agent, a struggling agent, a doing well but want to do better agent? What would you leave them with from your own personal advice that would maybe help them in life? It doesn't have to be business, anything. Anything is fair game. What would you tell them? Probably the best thing that I could tell them is find your why. Now, of course, I'm copying from a famous book, but if you know what motivates you, and it doesn't matter whether it's a pleasure point or a point of fear, if you can figure out what it is that motivates you, find your why, and use that why to get you out of bed every morning, get the top three things that are going to make you productive today, and continue on the next day and the next day, but find your why, find what motivates you that's going to keep you rolling. Because like I said, I started for the first 10 years, I had a couple of rental properties and I tried to do everything myself, but I didn't educate myself and I didn't push myself to learn more. So once I got my butt handed to me, I got back into it. That was one of the top things that got me to the point where I am now is just remembering to do a little bit every day, no matter whether you're sick, you're tired, you're burned out, find your motivation to get up and go talk to a real estate agent, go talk to an insurance, go in Georgia, go talk to a real estate attorney, you know, find people that are doing it, find people that are uh, good at what you, uh, what they do and interview them, talk to them, read an article keep going a little bit every day yeah you know i think that's huge because i look at even just my own business i i rose and rose and rose until i was very very comfortable i was making a lot of money at that point and uh at least in my mind and 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 i did see a small plateau in my business for a while until i met my my now wife 
who I realized would become my wife. And then I all of a sudden had a, a, dra a greater driving purpose that I then saw growth mm -hmm. in the business again. And then it kept happening, right? So then it became, we got engaged, I saw growth. We got married, I saw growth. And then I had, I had my two boys. I consistently are, am seeing growth because I have a deeper purpose that isn't just the money. Because if it was just the money, I would probably make a tenth of what I do today because it's just not relevant. But when it becomes about something that is greater than yourself, I 100% believe that because the hardest part in this job is the fact that we wake up every single morning with zero comfortability, with zero uh, assurances that anything will come of it. And that is the most difficult thing to be your own worst boss, but to get up anyways, to do those daily activities that you know eventually will pan out. The numbers are the numbers. So like if you call a thousand people, or I know you said you like door knocking, the reality is people can say they don't like it. But if you're a real estate agent and you do not have a deal today and you need one this week, and I said, hey, your family member's gonna die if you don't get one, and you sat down and you did. 100, 200, 300 door knocks, you would have a listing this week. That's the right. truth. People just don't want to do it. Yeah. Anyways, guys, well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Choice. Thanks, Chris, for joining us, and we will see you guys on the next one. My pleasure.